Hello, Dr. Pace, and welcome to Beyond Belief. How are you? How are things in Europe today? I'm fine. Uh, this was one of the rare days where we had some snow here in Dortmund, so <laughs> everything looks very pretty, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, talk to you. <laughs> me too, me too. I, I, As I mentioned to you before we started, I've been um, really enjoying this work that you have relatively recently put out. And if I, you know, in thinking about what the most important concepts in life are, it, for me, it's hard to think of anything that's more significant or more fundamental than, you know, ultimate reality, as you have en encapsulated in a word that I like, which is one. And um, this is a fascinating exploration of this, you know, this big O one concept. And I have a, a lot of questions for you, and, I, and these are questions that I think are absolutely fundamental and um, some of the most important questions that anyone can ask. So I think this is going to be an important conversation. So I'd like to frame the first question like this, if it's okay. Um, so you know, we have this concept of the of the hard problem of consciousness, which you know is uh, has been. People have been studying it for a very long time, have not cracked a, a hole in it just as of yet. But one of the approaches that people take is to say, listen, you know, your subjective consciousness is an illusion. It's not real. Um, and I find that that's basically a tough sell for a lot of people. It's hard for people to deny their most fundamental experience. So I wonder, when we consider the concept of one overarching reality and only one, are we asking people just to, to, all, to do the same thing, to deny their personal experience of plurality? When we look at the world, it's just full of many, many things. How are we supposed to believe that that's really all part of one thing? Yeah, well, I, I think we, we should distinguish between two different perspectives. Our perspective as a local being in space and time onto this universe and a more hypothetical uh, outside perspective onto the entire universe, which, well, it's, it's not it's not really possible to really have this perspective for any uh, mortal being somehow, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, uh, it's it's a hypothetical concept which helps in theory building and physics since then. Uh, physics, when we go to the most fundamental theories, we want to be really objective and abstract from everything personal and subjective. Uh, so I think we have to, to distinguish these two realities. And um, well, our, our experience as local beings in space and time is undeniably what it is. I mean, we experience many things in the universe. Uh, the question is, where do they come from? And how do they emerge from a more fundamental reality? And uh, my take is uh, that quantum mechanics suggest that this more fundamental reality, which is unobservable, but um, still real, uh, is one unified whole where these things come from. Okay, so I think that that unobservability is an important um, component of this. So what you're asking people to believe is despite their experience, everybody's experience, it's not the way it appears, um, which, which I think a lot of people could object to and I think a lot of people could maybe understand because there are many things about our observation of the world that are faulty, you know, from optical illusions to, to whatever. Like we have a very limited perspective and, um, on what's taking place. So that, that does make sense to me. You've also brought in the notion that ancient cultures have known this for a long time. And one of those um, is from the Eastern world. And you talk about the, I, I, don't, I never know if I'm pronouncing this right. Is it, is it Tao or Tao or both? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. Okay, let's call it, let's call it Tao. So yeah. in your book, you quote Lao Tzu, um, and he explains the concept of the Tao be, being the beginning of heaven and earth, which sounds very familiar to me, and the ancestor of myriad creatures, 
So literally meaning path or way, Tao is in fact yet another name for the one. So I had been taught to think, and you know, in my understanding of, the, of Eastern thought, is they're not so concerned about ultimate origins, and they're not, therefore they're not so focused on the one, rather whatever appears in, in front of us. Could you enlighten us a little bit more on that concept like uh, of the Easterns and the concept of oneness? Oh, well, <laughs> um, well I'm, I'm not a religious scholar. I'm, I'm a physicist. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a physicist. So I'm no expert on, on uh, especially Eastern concepts. And uh, actually, in my book, I mainly focus on on the idea of monism, on this philosophy of the one in the in the Western context. So I talk more about Platonism and uh, also why it's not more prominent in, in Western culture. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I I think I'm I'm not really qualified to 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 explain Taoism on a on a more substantial level. <laughs> okay, so so tell me tell us about monism then from a Western perspective. Yeah, well, I mean, um, yeah, I I think we find this this concept. Of course, there are differences, and there are there are philosophies which focus more more on the experience and philosophies which focus more on the ultimate reality but we find this idea that that what we experience are just different aspects of one unified reality one one unified whole in many cultures and um the east asian philosophies or religions you were mentioning like taoism or or hinduism the upanishads are one example but um it is also quite prominent in um, ancient Western philosophy. We find it in Heraclitus and in Plato and in Parmenides. Uh, not not quite so much in Plato's written work, but uh, at least in his followers, the ne Neo-Platonists, uh, which uh, worked and and taught as his academy in the in the centuries afterwards. So um, in ancient times, it seems many people believed that all these seemingly disjunct experiences we have of the world are just aspects of, of one unified whole. And uh, the question is, of course, uh, why is this thought not more prominent nowadays in, in Western culture? So it's interesting. The, uh... The writer and theologian C.S. Lewis talked about this from a from a moral perspective, and he used the exact same terminology of the Tao. And I just wanted to share a quote. It's this, it's the same kind of principle, but I just want to see how you react to it. He he says, "There has never been and never will be a radically new judgment of value in the history of the world. What purport to be new systems, or as we call them now, ideologies." all consist of fragments of the Tao itself, arbitrarily wrenched from their context in the whole and then swollen to madness in their isolation, yet still owing to the Tao and to it alone such validity as they possess. So he, he wants to extend this concept of, uh, of this monism, of this, of this oneness to the world of ethics and, and morality, and to say there is no, there's only one ethics, and if you borrow from it in any regard, you, you know, you're, you're using a part of it, but if you can't ignore the rest of it then. There, you can't pick and choose. It's just one unified holistic thing. So how, do, how do you feel about that based on everything that you, you've researched? Is that part of your um, thinking? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a physicist, so I'm more thinking about physical systems, of course, but I'm definitely sympathetic to the idea, right? I think that um, this monistic philosophy uh, is uh, something uh, which has its weaknesses, of course, but but uh, is um, yeah is is better than than simple ideologies of of black and white and good and evil, where we yeah, strongly polarize between people or between ideologies or systems of thought. Mm -hmm. um, I hear that, uh, although it does seem to me like it's a good, you know, uh, 
analog from the from the general concept it would follow it seems to me that there if there's just oneness then that possesses a oneness in all regards you know oneness in morality oneness in being um not that i claim to understand that and and the, and the questions that i'm going to be <laughs> asking you now are more in terms of trying to clarify exactly what that means and what some of uh, some of the implications are um and so the concept of of matter being an illusion is something that comes up. And um, let me just quote something from, this is from H. Dieter Ze, I hope I'm saying that correctly also, yes. who says, the only object that can truly exist in, the qu e exist in the quantum state of the entire universe in an all-encompassing unity and entangled quantum universe Everything else, including matter or particles, is an illusion. Okay, so I have several questions that come up for me um, as a result of that. One, I know this is a major part of quantum physics, but this whole concept of entanglement, what does it mean? Uh, I, I know it means that if particles interact, they have some kind of permanent relationship, but how do you apply that to the entire universe and what what does that mean what are the implications of that and then i'll get to my other questions in a minute yeah well okay um so entanglement is based on um the quantum concept that quantum objects can be both a particle and a wave for example and um when we have a wave uh we know a wave is something non-local a wave doesn't exist at one specific po point in space but if you throw a stone into a pond and there's a wave, it stretches over the surface of the pond. So the wave is non-local. And um, so this uh, implies that a quantum object also in general has no definite position. It can be at different positions at the same time as a wave. And this can be generalized to to all properties. It's not just position, but it's it's all possible properties a quantum object can have, they can be in the superposition, uh, they, they can coexist somehow. And an entanglement generalizes this concept of superposition to composed systems. So if you have two quantum objects and you um, make a, a combined quantum objects of these two constituents, uh, then you can know the state of the combined object uh, but um, since the combined object uh, is since, since the well for example think one of the constituents is red and the other one is blue and then the combined object would be violet uh, so you know, can know the, the combined object is violet but you don't know which of the subsystems is red and which one is blue, since uh, they can be in the superposition of red and blue. And maybe both are half red and half blue, or uh, one is red, the other one is blue, or the, the first is blue and the other one is red. So, so all these possibilities exist. So you don't know anything about the subsystems anymore. You just know the state of the total system. Mm -hmm. And um, quantum objects, are totally defined by the properties. If you know all the properties of a quantum object, you know the quantum object. So that means if you have no clue about the properties of the subsystems in your whole, these subsystems don't really exist. And uh, so this is the main message of entanglement, that you can know the whole, but you don't know anything about the subsystems and you can't really even say that they exist. And um, what you said before, uh, that you have this correlation, is just a consequence of that. If you then take the subsystems and you separate them by a large distance, then you still have no clue what properties these subsystems have, mm -hmm. but they are still correlated, since the red of the one and the blue of the other still add up to the violet of the total state, even if they are separated by a large distance. So the correlations remain. So my understanding is that Erwin Schrodinger, when, when he came up with his example of the, the cat in a box, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is either living or dead, and we just 
don't know, and and therefore we have, we should surmise that it's in a superposition of living and dead simultaneously, which of course strikes most people as impossible. It, didn't Schrodinger himself propose that as uh, a way of sort of making fun of the concept, um, or you know challenging it? Like, of course that can't be, and therefore the the principle doesn't hold. It it's, it's so counterintuitive it, that reality would be that way, um, that you could have multiple things happening at the exact same instant. Like, how, how are we supposed to process that as regular people? <laughs> you know, that, um, the, again, the implications of it seem enormous uh, w as to our understanding of what's real. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's... it's um... It's a fundamental change of thought somehow, but but it's not the first fundamental change of thought that we experience as humanity, right? I mean, if, if you would have told someone a few hundred years ago that we are all made out of atoms or that we are related to apes or uh, that um, there may be other planets in the universe where, where um, other civilizations may live or something like that, uh, you would would have gotten you a similar have response. It. I mean, or if you have told them about the World Wide Web or things like that. I mean, it's these these things. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes when we gain knowledge which is uh, far away from our everyday experience, uh, this requires that that we somehow, yeah, re readjust our our view of nature and our view of what the universe is. Okay, so going back for a second, um, therefore, at least Professor Ze concluded that the material world is an illusion. Okay, do you agree with that? And let, let's start with that. Do you agree with that? Um, yeah, it, it depends what, what you mean by illusion. I mean, it is, of course, what we experience, and it's not that something we can choose freely, whether the world is material or not, and decide, well, today I don't want to have a material world. <laughs> it is it is our experience, it is our world we live in, but um, it is not fundamental. I mean, it is, it is something which is a consequence out of our specific perspective onto the universe. Okay, but so I presume that you, you conduct your life as if you exist. And um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay, but in a sense, it's saying that we don't, or, or not at least in the way that we imagined that we did. Um, and so, what in what sense, if we're if we're taking this absolute ultimate principle, you know, in what sense do we exist if we're going to conclude that that physical reality is is illusory? H how do I exist? Um, Yes, that's that's my concern and my question. And yeah, this touches um, on deep. This is this this moves quickly into theological areas, you know, yeah. um, which which I'm saving for the end. But um, <laughs> it certainly smacks of of certain classical theology, in, um, and which is fascinating. But most people are just not going to be, you know, prepared to 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 live according to that conclusion. Like, yeah, it, it's obvious to me that I'm here and I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, it's not going to bother people, I think, too much that maybe they're an illusion. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I, I don't have the final answers, right? I mean, um, That's even okay. even if I go as far and say, well, we are information which is somehow processed on some quantum degrees of freedom and so on. Even then, the question is, well, what if this fundamental reality, this one, doesn't even have time and space? And uh, then uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about information being processed since nothing is happening anymore. And then <laughs> it doesn't make sense to talk about consciousness since, at least in my understanding, consciousness is always a process in time. And uh, then um, if we don't have consciousness and we don't exist, of course, we don't have a perspective onto the universe and we can ask, where's this perspective coming from? And somehow it's, uh, we, we end up with a chicken egg problem and it gets really complicated. I, I, my, my guess would be that 
these things somehow emerge together, but I'm far from knowing all the answers. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm with you on that. But you're, uh, <laughs> in terms of physics, you know uh, a heck of a lot more than most people. So, um, okay, one of the... One of the analogies that you use in the book, which I really appreciate, is the uh, the concept of a, a projector um, mm -hmm. displaying what reality is, and um, I really like the concept that there's the there's the film moving across the the, the light source, and the film and what's mm -hmm. projected on the screen is sort of like our reality, and the bulb is the ultimate reality. You know, in this analogy, mm -hmm. okay, and yes. so fa fascinatingly. It's the film that is only by limiting the ultimate reality do we experience ours. So, like, it, which I think makes all kinds of sense. That if you know, if the film was not in place, then the bulb would overwhelm reality itself, and all that we would see is light. Right? Yes. Okay. So that is precisely the way the way this is described in Kabbalistic sources. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, that you know that there is. This, this one ultimate energy force being whatever you want to call it. You know, when we, we usually don't give it uh, positive appellations. We just say what it's not, you know, it, it's, it, it's not finite, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so again, what, 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 what in your thinking, what is the bulb and what is the film? You know, what, what is, what, what is, I, and I know you don't have all the answers, and I know I'm, I know I'm prodding you um, yes. to, to deliver the ultimate meaning of of, of the, the universe, but that's okay because I think that your I think your work is touching on it, and uh, and it's okay to talk about. But um, what's the bulb? What's the film? How do they work together? Well, the bulb is the ultimate quantum reality of the universe. It's uh, the quantum state of the universe, and uh, the film is is the limitation of our perspective. We don't mm -hmm. see the entire universe, we see only part of it. And uh, due to that, we experience the world as separate things. And uh, it might even be that due to that, we experience these separate things in time and space. And um, yeah, it's it's very interesting that there are these parallels to, to, the, to the Kabbalah. I, I'm no expert on that. It's, uh, I don't know much about it, but um, I I think that um, this tradition might also have helped to to for for this monistic philosophy to reemerge in the Renaissance times, mm -hmm. since it had somehow a food both in the Islamic world and the Christian world, and the Islamic world was somewhat more open about these philosophies from the ancient times, and uh, yeah, so, yes. so I think. That, these are interesting historic developments. Me too. Um, and and so, sort of in conclusion, with the um, with the with the various perspectives, and really this is a matter of perspective. And you know the um, the role of the observer, you know, which I know in quantum physics is a huge topic that we almost. Creates our realities to some extent by by our observation of it, which is wild to begin with, um, and 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 opens all kinds of uh, doors for other questions. But I like uh, in your book, uh, which I'm going to recommend again to everybody. It's called The One. It and everyone sh you should go and read this book. Very well written, and and, and I also want to to tell you that your your discussion at the beginning of uh, of all the different famous physicists, Heisenberg and and Schrodinger, and it's really well done. I it, it's entertaining, <laughs> and I didn't know a lot of the background about you know where they were coming from as people. You know, there are these famous names, but I never I didn't know much about them as people, and it's just fascinating to see like they're competitive, they're jealous, they have like, they're, <laughs> they're people, you know? Yeah. And you, you, you tend to think of them as like these uber geniuses, you know, who, who are just sitting in these, you know, these, these uh, otherworldly realms, you know, uh, explaining reality. But anyway, so that, that was great. And um, you talk about this concept of the, the bird and the frog. Mm -hmm. And the, the bird represents like, you know, the bird I 
view of the 30,000 foot, you know, not that birds can go that high, but a view of, of reality. And frogs represent being down here on Earth, so to speak. And, and I want to quote something that you wrote. You say the emergence of matter and possibly even space and time isn't a real process in the fundamental quantum universe. It only describes the impression an observer located in space and time gets about this fundamental reality. The bird perspective is physically real and the frog perspective and all the human language we use to describe it is merely a useful approximation for describing our subjective perceptions. Okay. And now, I just want to, I've been, I've been having this back and forth, sorry to bring up the Kabbalah again, but I've been having this, mm -hmm. this back and forth with this Kabbalist that I... No, no, I, I like that. Too. Okay, good. So, <laughs> I think it's very interesting. <laughs> so the thing that I've been trying to clarify, there is a, there, there is a concept in, in Kabbalistic thinking, uh, it's called Ein Od Milvado, which literally means there is nothing besides him or it, you know, what you would call the bulb or, you know, ultimate consciousness or the universal consciousness, like, you know, what some people would call God. Um, so we have this concept of being able to perceive reality from the infinite perspective, in which case nothing changed. There was no creation that there, it, it, it's not, it's illusory on, on some level. And on the other, there's our perspective, you know, which has the multiplicity of objects and, and, and so on, so on and so forth in the world. My, my question, my debate that I, or that my clarification I've been trying to figure out is this, this exact point of does our reality actually exist um, or not? And uh, so he's been assuring me that it absolutely does. And not only does it exist, it exists in just as fundamental a, or maybe not as fundamental, but as much of a, a real way as the ultimate perspective. And I just want to read you something that he said, and I'll get your take on it, and, and we'll wrap it mm -hmm. up. But um, so he Who said, is his name is Wilk. Um, okay. He said, this is another angle on this concept of there is no other than him. That since all the, f the physicality exists solely based on what's called the or in so the light of the infinite, right, the same bulb, literally the same bulb concept, mm -hmm. that is coming into the physical through these things called sparks. Therefore, truthfully, there is nothing other than the all. The fact that our perspective is totally dependent on him, the all, he made this reality, whereas his perspective isn't dependent on ours at all, doesn't take away from our reality that he created. Okay, so, if I had to summarize that all into a question, could you just clarify a little bit the, the bird versus the frog? And if you see any analogy in what, what, what we're discussing here, that there is this ultimate, it's described as this light that permeates mm -hmm. all of existence. And nonetheless, um, it gives rise to this other perspective, which ultimately is us. I don't really have the answer myself either, whether this secondary reality is really real or it's just only real f as far as we're concerned i know that's a lot it was a lot to throw out all at yeah. once well uh it depends again of course of what you want to call real and what you want to call an illusion and but um yeah so so coming back to the to the start of the question so the bird perspective is like looking into the light bulb to to see the real origin of things, the, the fundamental reality. The frog perspective is the perspective of the people in the audience, which look what's going on on the screen, the movie. And um, so um, coming back to what you said earlier, that, that we somehow live in this, this uh, kind of limited perspective, uh, I think it's, it's maybe similar to the way we live in a movie when we watch a movie and we are really emotionally engaged we we kind of live in that movie although we know on a on a deeper level it's it's just some kind of illusion but still we we yeah we live in it to yeah. some extent uh, okay so um then the question how is this frog perspective this limited perspective part of the fundamental perspective and um quantum physically the fundamental perspective is just uh, all 
which could happen and all possible uh, possible superpositions of it. So everything which could happen is in this fundamental perspective. And if this fundamental perspective is real, then of course, are real in, in that sense, also the, the limited perspectives are real since they are part of this fundamental perspective. Right. Like, um, if we go, go away from the, from the picture with a movie and we just take, for example, a colored lens instead of, or a prism instead of a, a film roll, then uh, the original light bulb will, will, be, will be split into different colors. But all these colors are present in the white light bulb. So, so to some extent, they are part of this fundamental reality, but only a small, limited part. This, this again, like I said at the very beginning, like I think this is the most fundamental and most important question that that people can be asking. I think that the implications of it are huge, um, and I really appreciate your your exploration of it. And I'm going to show people uh, once again, this is a book that you should get and you should read. I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to discuss this concept uh, with me, and I really look forward to. Um, your future work and everything that you're going to be doing. I'm going to be following it closely. And for those watching, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please check out beyondbelief.blog where we have uh, all kinds of fascinating topics like this and more. And um, for Heinrich Peitz, thank you so much for uh, being with me today. And I look forward to speaking to you again in the future. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you. Take care.